Hey, it's me, Colin. I'm thrilled to be here with you today. This is our long-awaited interview with Ken Levine that we've been teasing for a while, an interview with someone fun and exciting and interesting, one of my very favorite people in the industry. I know a lot of you feel the same way. So we're going to get right into that conversation. But before we did, I wanted to give you a little bit of a prelude. First of all, you notice I'm wearing the same shirt. This is coincidental. I'm recording this more than a week later. Yes, I did my laundry. You know I only wear the same five or six shirts over and over again. But I wanted to let you guys know that towards the back end of the podcast, you might, especially if you're watching on video, you might notice a few clips, a few cuts. Um, We did tell Ken that he had the right to tell us, you know, to watch the podcast and tell us if he wanted anything cut out just to kind of be safe with what's going on with Judas and all these things, not step on too many toes. Um, He did take advantage of that. So you'll see a few cuts and those will fade kind of in and out of black. So I wanted to let you know in case you see that awkwardness, what's happening there. And then we did cut out uh, based on Ken's request, a, a pretty sizable portion of the end of the podcast. Nothing too crazy. We just don't want to spoil things to get too crazy with um, with Judas quite yet. And wanted to kind of focus more on some of these other conversations that we have within the within the talk that we that we conducted with each other. So um, I guess this is a long winded way of me telling you that you'll see some of these cuts. It might be a little bit of an awkward segue, but that's the reason why you'll see me on the outro as well. I'll just remind everyone that you know the podcast is going to kind of suddenly end because of some of the things we cut. But just wanted to nip that in the bud so there are no questions or concerns about that. We were thrilled to have Ken. This conversation is great. I think you're going to love it. Enjoy. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols Plus, a PlayStation podcast supplement. My name is Colin Moriarty. Today, I'm joined, as you can see, by a very special guest indeed. Ken Levine, the writer, creator of Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite, longtime uh, professional in the industry, working now on Judas, which we cannot wait to see more of. Ken, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you for the honor. Thanks, Colin. It's good to be here. We've been talking about it for a long time. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. I um, For people that so people out there know that I love writing letters and that <laughs> listen to our show. And uh, I don't know why. I just think it's it's like I like just touching base with people. And uh, I was going through like notes in my old email and I'm like, shit, I never sent Ken a Christmas card because I asked for your address and then it just never came together. So I wrote you a letter just to let you know that I was thinking about you. And especially I wanted to let you know that, uh, you know, I was so amped to see Judas uh, in December. Um, and I sell cele- as I told you in our letter I, or my letter, I celebrated like it was I was watching the Jets or something when I saw it. It was it was wild. It was beautiful. It was exactly what I wanted. So I wanted it months later. Of course, congratulate you on finally showing the world that. And um, yeah, just tell you we're all thrilled. I mean, the audience is so excited for it. I got to say, it was nice to get a physical letter. I can't remember the last time I got like a non-Christmas, like like an actual written letter that wasn't part of a larger mailing or so. Thank you for sending me a letter. I was like, it was kind of cool. Yeah, no no problem. Yeah, I I would like to bring letter writing back. Like I wish there's like things where people have pen pals and all that still and all that. But I just think it's a we're a little lazy. I'm a little lazy these days oh, keeping yeah. in touch with people. So it's good. To, it's a, it's like what better way to let someone know you're you're thinking about them than are taking you the old enough to when like that was what you did? Oh, yeah, I'm 30. I'm that. 38. So, yeah, it was we, we wrote I had like a literal pen pal in middle school and stuff yeah. like that. And like, I don't know where it was, Japan or something. But yeah, I mean, my, my, I'm the youngest of four. So my siblings used to send me letters and mail all the time. But by the time I became a, co- a college student, it was basically over, you know. Um, so, Ken, um. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your career and then I obviously want to talk to you, you know, you and I were bouncing back and forth. And when we talk, we love, you know, you and I love talking about things that pertain to the creation of games, to politics, to expression and all those things. And I think we can talk about all of that framed around Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite. And um, yeah, and then we can just go from there. I'm, I don't really like pre-planning. I want to go where you want to go. So I hope those topics are okay with you. And I wanted to kind of begin by letting you, for those few out there that don't know you or of you in our audience, uh, the chance to introduce yourself and kind of set yourself up. Who are you? Because um, it's a very big deal for a lot of us that you're here right now. And we appreciate that. And you're the creative mind behind one of the most influential games I'd argue ever made. So please tell us about yourself. Um, yeah, I'm a, I say I, I've been making games, I guess, since I joined the industry in 95. So it's almost 30 years, which is kind of weird to say. Um, and before that, I was a screenwriter in L.A. And I did um, I sort of gave that a shot and didn't do as well as I had hoped to do. But, I, you know, I was this weird 
like a little prodigy. I was like, got an agent when I was in so in college and had all this, like, I got flown out, like on a first class flight, you know, from college and met, you know, was wine and dine all around Hollywood. And, um, and then I did one movie and it just kind of fizzled out. And, you know, it's a very strange place to be because, you know, I was a kid, I, you know, I'd won like, you know, I'd won like writing contests and then all this stuff. And you kind of feel you're on this path to like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm one, I'm like a special person, you know, I'm, 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 I'm special and different. And then you like completely go and you, then your dreams don't pan out and you're like, wait a minute, this wasn't the plan, but you know, that's what life is for pretty much everybody. Right. You know, you, Indeed. most people's dreams don't work out. And so I, I really got to have that experience as a young person of, um, of not, of not realizing my ambition. And it was very, very humbling. Um, I, so for like five or six or seven years, I just sort of did various jobs, like computer consulting and graphic design. Um, and I was sort of still living in LA for most of that. So I was sort of on the edges of the industry and, you know, but, um, but never, you know, I, I, I figured that was it. You know, I had sort of had my shot bite at the apple and, you know, I blew it. And then um, I went to, a, it's so interesting. I went to, you know, you know, the classic story of the high school reunion where the nerd goes back to the high school reunion, but all of a sudden he's really successful and the right. jock is a loser. Well, the opposite thing happened to me. I went to my high school reunion and I actually ran into like the school jock who's actually a super nice guy. Like, even though I was like a nerdy little dweeb, he was never mean to me. He was always very nice to me. They, not all of them were, but, but he was actually very nice. And I ran to him and, you know, he looked great and he had his own business. He introduced me to his beautiful wife and I, you know, wasn't happy where I was career wise or romantically at the point. And I was like, oh my God, like the thing I thought was going to happen, happened in reverse. And, um, <laughs> And I sort of decided, like, okay, like, you got to figure this out. And, um, you know, I tried, I, at that point, I tried to sort of come back and make it as a playwright. But writing straight plays is not, is not really, a, you know, it's a very hard to break into that business. So I was in New York trying to do that. And, um, and I was like, well, I, I've always played games. You know, I had always ever since I was a little kid, I was playing games before, you know, I used to go to the arcade before there were you know, prior to Pong, where there was like electro, you know, pinball machines and these sort of electromechanical machines. Um, you know, it's hard even to describe it. You have this whole baseball game where a big like pinball with like, like a drawing of like a little drawing of a play field and this ball would come out next to the drawing of the pitcher and you have to swing the bat and you're basically aiming for various targets. And they're all like a pinball, like a pinball machine. You had a lot of machines like that. If you remember in Jaws, that movie, like there's like a little arcade game where you're shooting at a shark. Yeah. Like, you know, and that's just basically a bunch of lit up drawings, essentially. And I loved all that stuff. And then, you know, then video games came along um, and I was just, you know, blown away. I was just like immediately obsessed. Um, you know, so I was there for, you know, um, you know Pong and, and Pac-Man. And, and um, I think, you know, Asteroids was huge for me. There was this bowling alley up by my house where I I was a kid and this was the seventies. So or early eight, late seventies. So life was a little different back then. So me and my friends used to like go and like steal packs of cigarettes from his mom's house and then like take some quarters and go up to the bowling. I mean, nobody cared. Like we'd be, you know, these 12 year olds smoking cigarettes, playing asteroids. And, <laughs> uh, and we probably weren't really even smoking it. We we're probably just, you know, like, you know, not even yeah, like coughing them or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Coughing out and spitting because we were trying to be cool. Um, you know, there was a movie called the bad news bears back then where, um, the kid who played, um, there was this really cool kid who smoked it, had a motorcycle, he was like 13. It was Jackie R. Haley who ended up playing um, um, Rorschach. Now, as an adult, he played Rorschach in um, in Watchmen. Jim Cotter? Uh, in, oh. In, in Watchmen. In what? In, in what? No, no, Rorschach in Watchmen. Oh, Rorschach. I know. Oh, okay, Rorschach in Watchmen. I thought you said Rorschach for some reason. Rorschach in Watchmen. So, yeah, so you do know this. Um, yeah, Watchmen. Yeah, I actually only am familiar with it through the HBO series i think i don't even think no, I, that's not, you're breaking my heart here um i'm sorry to hear that the um and so <laughs> you know i had always loved i had always loved games and then i thought well you've always loved games you know and i i had had you know i've been playing games my whole life and then you know i had um and i remember like borrowing a friend's pc you know in the 90s and like getting civilization and xcom and you know all those inc incredible games and ultima underworld was i was a game that really impacted me um if you guys don't know that was a game from a company called looking glass um 
prior to System Shock, in you know, one of the first games, the first game I'm sure one of the first games I'm known for is a game called System Shock 2. But I played this game, Ultima Underworld, which they did before the System Shock franchise. And that was the first, I guess, what you call immersive, what you call now an immersive sim. And um, it's like a dungeon crawler, but instead of you know, overhead view or sort of tile by tile view. They used to have these games where you sort of move the dungeon like one square at a time. There was, there was, it wasn't fully 3D at all, like wizardry and games like that. Um, and I remember playing that game and realizing, oh my God, like this game lets you tell your own stories. Like it lets you experience events that nobody else is experiencing. And that, that notion of, you know, the term um, emergence, right, was such an eye-opener for I still remember the moment I played and realized what that was doing. And it was, you know, if you look at it now, it's incredibly crude. Um, you know, you could even probably show screenshots of what it looked like. You know, it was like had a rendering window like this big and the rest of the screen was like, you know, like interface. But, oh my God. Um, and I was, then I became a huge fan of that company. And then, you know, cut to years later, you know, I had, I was disappointed in my life. I'd come back from that, you know, from that, reunion and i was like what if i try to get into games maybe this is you know place for me and pretty much i applied to looking glass and they to my great surprise offered to fly me up there you know from new york to boston to have an interview and i went up and i interviewed all day and i met everybody and to my great surprise i got the job um and that's how i got in and then i you know started working on a game that with doug church that eventually became thief um, the original thief and I got to, you know, see a game from the very beginning. And I was there for about a year and a half. And then I decided, you know, sort of, I'm not sure, um, for reasons that probably would evade me now, but to um, go off and start my own, uh, my own company with two partners, with um, a guy named Rob Fermier and a guy named John Che. And we started Irrational. And then we ended up working again with Looking Glass to do this game, System Shop 2, which sort of put us on the map. And then, um, you don't know how much detail you want, but, you know, then Bioshock and a bunch of games and Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite. And, you know, here we are. Yeah, it's it's interesting because my experience, my history with you begins with Bioshock. Um, and as I said earlier, it's one, I, mean, I can say this with great confidence being in the industry for so long from the media point of view, I guess, is that there are very few games and you must know this regardless of you know, it, it's not quite as prodigious in sales as, as other take two products or some other take two products or whatever, but it's one of those persistent games that everyone loves and talks about. I mean, it's, it's an influential dynamo. And I remember when it came out, I was, I had just started a full time at IGN when it came out and it p- completely bowled the office over. And, and it remains one of those games that I think really tells a story and, and emerge and immerses people in a way that still really isn't matched today. And I wonder you know, you said quite a bit about Bioshock and Bioshock's been written about and covered quite a bit. So I don't want to, you know, retread too much ground. But are you surprised by how resonant that game is still today and how influential and important it is? It makes people want to make games. I mean, that's a, that's a game that a lot of people even cite. Well, somebody told me recently and this. I, nobody had told me. I've never gotten this one before that they grew up, you know, they, they were young when it came out. They were like, um, you know, it's 15 years ago. So they were like, um, you know in their teens or something when it came out of their early twenties, maybe at most. And now they're playing it with their kid. Um, their kid's old enough, like 10 or 12 now, and they're playing it together. And um, that's cool, you know, because then it's like another generation, but yeah, I mean, you never, I, I don't think it's possible. I've never been a person who was working on a project and I'm like, Oh uh, yeah, I'm confident this is going to change the world. Sometimes you get a feeling like you're, you're working on something cool. And sometimes you're working, but most often you're working on something that you might think is cool, but nobody else seems to think it's cool. Mm. Like nobody thought System Shock 2 was going to have an influence. You know, none of us, we we were just like trying to get it done, honestly. And Bioshock, I think we started to get the idea that people, it was going to be important to people with the first hands-on event we did in New York. We had this big event and a lot of the press was there. And I had, you know, I had, I had, demonstrated a whole bunch of games you know this probably that's like my fifth or sixth game or something i had worked on and so i had you know when i had done press on all those games and um you know you see a range of things where people are like oh it's cool you know we had a game like tries vengeance or say um you know which people like oh it's for freedom force people liked you know they liked it but there's something about bioshock that was just really um landing with people though you know we don't like to get ahead of our skis on these things so we just you know we're just like 
I was mostly focused on what can, you know, we still have a little time left. Is there anything I can learn from this event, how to make the game better? Because, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in talking to people who play our games. We do a lot of play tests. Not like, we don't do tests like before the game's designed. We don't like ask people what kind of game they want to play. But once it's right. getting solidified, we really like to put it in people's hands because it's really hard to have perspective on your own thing. Um, and so we, 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 you know, on Judas, we've been having people play it for a couple of years now um and getting feedback and we're getting, we continue and we'll just keep ramping up the number of people who play it so by the time it launches hopefully we'll have enough critical mass of people who played it that we have a reasonable understanding of what people's sense of it is well congratulations by the way on the game not leaking authentically not <laughs> leaking people didn't know you know you I told know. me a little bit about it you told me the name about it a while ago i wasn't going to obviously say anything but i was i'm always surprised like people tell me things and then you see them pop up you know and i was really happy for you that you got that pop I would say I, 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 there are people I've talked to over the years like you or like, you know, Ryan or somebody like that, you know, who, who had seen the game and and people worked on the game, too. You know, people it's been a long time. So there are people mm -hmm. who've been on the team and people moved on, whatever. But nobody ever leaked it. And I really, you know, to everybody who knew about it, I, I got to say, you know, I really appreciate it because it's it, it, I think it's pretty heartbreaking when stuff gets leaked out when the team's working on it and it can't be shown in its proper light. Um, I think that's really hard on a team. And I think that it's, I understand why it happens. I understand the, you know, the sort of the business incentives of, you know, various press outlets and stuff, but it's, I think it's hard on the team. It really is. Yeah. It's uh, I, my, my whole thing has always been, if people su supply me with information and it's like good enough to verify with a second or third source and go live with that, I will. But if people are trusting me to see things off the record, that's different. You know, that's just always been my line in the sand. But um, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you this and I, I didn't know how else to put it. So I wrote it like this in my notes. I, I called Bioshock as having a sort of sophistication. I wonder if you agree with that, that 15 years later, that the game is kind of sophisticated, not only from its subject matter, but just the way it's delivered. My brother and I, who do a podcast, a retro podcast together, played it a couple of years ago um, together, you know, like uh, and individually and did a conversation about it. And I was so happy to introduce him to it. And he loved it. And um, we were marveling and I still marvel today about how some simple decisions like audio diaries really help keep the game going. It's kinetic, yet really deep and still really fun. And when the special edition or the PS4 updated version or whatever came out, I was so thrilled to play it again. In fact, I think this is the game we always talk about, about wishing you can kind of blink it out of existence in your mind so you can experience it again for the first time. I think it, I really do think it has that level of sophistication. I wonder if you agree or if you kind of hear that kind of feedback on Bioshock. It kind of stands above a lot of other games in this regard. I mean, I think people play and I play different games for different reasons. You know, like I play Mario just for the pure, unadulterated, brilliant, you know, design and the understanding of mechanic and how to build on mechanics and build on player knowledge and then have them exploit mechanics, combine mechanics and all that genius that, you know, Miramoto and his people like him bring to the table. Um, um, for Bioshock, I, I don't know if sophistication is the right thing. I think primarily the difference is, is a, I came to the industry with a different set of um, books, movies and TV shows than a lot of game developers do. So I never really read um, a lot of science fiction or fantasy, for instance. I saw a lot of movies like that, but, and I played Dungeons and Dragons and I played video games, but for some reason, um, you know, I was a, I was a drama major in college. And so, you know, I was reading, you know, Tennessee Williams and, 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 you know, and, um, Euripides and, you know, all, all this stuff that I had to for my classes. And, you know, I was exposed to like German expressionism and, and, you know, various types of architecture and set design classes and things like that. So is that where the art deco comes from and all that? that you, well, I'll tell you where the, I can tell you in a minute where the art deco yeah. specifically came from. Um, and um, and so, you know, and the kind of movies I watch, you know, like the Manchurian Candidate was, you know, a fair movie of mine. And, you know, I love like the Coen brothers and Paul Thomas Anderson. I, and it's weird because I am not a highbrow in music. I'm not a highbrow in games like I like pop like I like all kinds of music, including like the worst, like the dumbest country or pop or, or whatever. I'll, I, I'm not a snob. I'm not a snob when it comes to um, games at all. Like I, I'm not a, like, a, I gotta play all kinds of games. I'll play anything. And I like, I like, you know, sort of, um, you know, I'll play a gone home or I'll play, you know, 
you know, Serious Sam or I'll play, you know, Mario or I'll play whatever. I'll play anything because I just love games. But I think that my interest in sort of theater and 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 movies were sort of a little different than some people's. And I brought a lot of those influences into what I do. And that's why it felt, I'd say it probably feels different. I don't know if it's more sophisticated or less sophisticated or whatever, but it definitely feels a little different because of that. It's interesting to me because it's another take to publish or 2K publish game in Spec Ops The Line, who Walt Williams wrote, who wrote, worked with you on the original or worked under you on the original Bioshock. He would, he, I actually interviewed him for a book that I ended up never writing, um, but I wrote a sample chapter for uh, the publisher I was working for, or work, going to do it for, and we did it about Bioshock. Um, and I wish I still had the original like transcripts of it. I don't, but I do remember very clearly him going on and on about the influence of seeing something so finely done and how I saw an echo in Spec Ops The Line simply in the meaningful nature of the story. Um, and so I think there is something really interesting genetically in Irrational and in Bioshock that kind of spread its tendrils just with, with in a few different ways. I, yeah, hope, I hope I'm remembering this correctly. So Walt could correct me if, if I'm not. But I remember Walt came in. I think he was at that point just a like a sort of junior producer at 2K. Mm-hmm. And he came out to Boston from San Francisco, I think. And he stayed in the, you know, he stayed out with us and he helped out in a bunch of tasks. But I remember, and God, Walt, if, I, if I'm remembering this incorrectly, let me know. But I remember he was taking screenshots for press and he brought them to me. And I think what he might meant is that I kept rejecting the screenshots. Um, and I think that, I think he told me afterwards that that process was both really frustrating for him and eye opening for him at the same time, because I am, I will iterate on something past anybody's sanity. You know, I am, I have an obsession for detail. Um, in some ways, in like the other case, cases, I like my scripts when I write them and turn them in, they have to be completely like copy checked and because I, I, I have to make a million typos. But when I'm looking at the screen, um, I am, I am sort of this tireless obsession with details and it drives people insane. But I want, but I, 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 don't, I have an ability to see the game as a gamer sees it. Like rather than somebody who's seen it a thousand times, I, I think I'm pretty good at clearing out my brain and just coming at it fresh. Like if I just opened that issue of game inform or whatever, and I was looking at that screen, I'm like, Oh, what does it look like to a gamer? You know? Mm. And that can be exhausting to be around, I think. And if I recall, I exhausted the hell out of Walt. but I seem to remember at the end, he was like, okay, I think I get, you know, I get why you you're this way. Um, but I think it can be, you know, it's not always super exciting to be around because sometimes people just want to go home. You know, they don't want to do the 50th pass on something, but I'm, but I, you know, I generally find the only way to get the quality level, I don't have like some kind of like special genius. I just like have an obsession with detail that I'm willing to do it and do it and look at it and look at it and write it and rewrite it over and over again. Cause first time out, I'm like anybody else. I'm just gonna, I'm not that good, you know? So I just make up for it with, you know, I just never get out of the pool. Yeah. I wanted to ask you a little bit about that later. Cause I have some notes about, um, kind of the way the press is written about you and sure. some stories told about you. I'm very interested in knowing more about that as well from your perspective. Yep. Um, speaking of the original Bioshock, I mean, 15 years on, as we keep saying, what, what in your mind is the, what were you trying to say in that game? What, what was it? Is it, is your answer the same today as it would be back then? I mean, or, from my perspective, it's, Obviously, Randian libertarianism run amok, obviously. But what I liked about it was that I don't think it was necessarily, at least from my perspective, lampooning it. It was simply one version of it. And um, I think some people misunderstood a lot of that in the in the game. Um, But I and you can tell me if I'm wrong about that. But also it's about, you know, class and economics. I I don't uh, capitalism. I wonder what were you trying to say with that game? I mean, I don't think there's any. I, part of, you know, there's this great saying that I, somebody said, I write so I know what I'm thinking, you know, it's a way to organize your own thoughts. Mm-hmm. And so I don't go into things with an axe to grind. I think one of the reasons I've never met a libertarian, I've never met a, well, Ram, Ram would, would not agree that she's a libertarian, right? So right. like an objectivist, met, right? I never <laughs> met an objectivist or a libertarian because, you know, I, I think they're probably closer than Ram might admit because I think she was protecting her brand to some degree. I've never met an objectivist who didn't who objected to the game. <laughs> um, 
because I think they, I think we tried to give it not a fair shot because I'm not a, I'm not like the referee. I try to understand, look, if you're going to write characters, can't judge them. You know, you have, even if you're writing the most evil, you know, motherfucker in the universe, can I curse on this thing? Cause I yes. don't yep, absolutely. You're in the you know, most evil person in the universe. They've always, they're the hero of their own story. That doesn't mean they're a hero. I mean, they perceive themselves as a hero of their own story. And I think that if you, if you don't try to understand where sort of bad outcomes come from, especially in yourself, um, you know, you can find, end up in a lot of bad outcomes. And so I, I like to write stories where I don't really like to write about villains, you know, cause I, I don't know what a villain is. I know there are people who end up doing things that are quite villainous. Right. Um, but how did they get there is what's interesting to me because that's how you understand, you know, if you can predict, you know, where society is going or you can predict where people are going, it's because you know where they've been. I mean, I was talking to somebody recently who works in um, machine learning and um, they have a business where they predict terrorist attacks. And the way they do that is they don't predict anything. They look at the past. They have massive, you know, basically, basically since the advent of social media, you, um, you have a huge amount of data about, you know, chatter on the internet and you see patterns, you can start to detect, you know, you see, you go back in the past and you say, well, there was this event that happened here in 2012 or whatever. And let's go look at the, um, and here's an event that happened in 2009. Here's an event that happened here. And you start seeing, looking for similar, you know, basically waveforms in the, in the conversation. And then you can predict the future, you know, with a fair degree of accuracy based upon, um, based upon the past. And so I, I think the reason the games can sort of become somewhat, you know, believable, can become more believable than say some games is because I spent a lot of time thinking about the past and sort of dissecting the past. I read a lot of history. Um, I think that also is another reason our games are a little different um, is I read a lot of sort of social history and military history. And um, you can definitely see that in Bioshock Infinite, I think. <clears throat> yeah. Major uh, knowing, you know, when I was, a, I, I didn't know much about that. that specific, I knew about World War One, but I didn't know much about like Fendi Asik. And you know, and the and the gold and the and the um in the Gilded Age, um, if I mispronounce that French, that I took six years for French and I still can't pronounce anything. Um, I hear you. <laughs> so um, I, I think that it's it was it was you know it's all my weird nerdy hobbies coming together. So mm. I don't really try to say anything. I'm like, well, what do I know something about, and how can I leverage that to tell a cool story? Um, but at the end of the day all the history and all the architecture and all the art and all the whatever, it has to be in service of people, you know, characters. Characters are everything. Um, and telling cool stories. I wanted to double back on something I'd mentioned earlier, but because I, I wanted to get your your take on this in, in, a more, in a more thorough way, which is the audio diary. Like the choice of doing an audio diary is always sticks with me as someone who, again, we write, I write, I write our games, but they're old school games, so we don't have an opportunity to do audio, but I feel like this is such a clever and, like I said, kinetic way to do things. And it still frustrates me um, when games have really thick, beautiful worlds. Like I think about a game like Control. I don't know if you played that game. Um, and there's just so much in it, but it is so much reading. And I remember preparing for our spoiler cast. I read it for hours and hours. And I still didn't get through all of the documents and I was confused. And then I was remarking and thinking about a game like Bioshock or like some other games where it's like it kind of keeps it simple, but it's progressing you in a very, it, it's not very linear either, but it's, it's just like, this is the way it's going to go. You're alone. It's haunting and you're hearing this. And it maybe doesn't make a lot of sense when you think about it, about why would people just be talking into these things and leaving them all over the place, but yeah. it serves the game. And I love it. I love it so much more than written journals or yeah. playing resident evil and finding clues and newspapers and stuff. I don't know. Is that something that you take away as a, as a, I think that's one of the big revel, and not that it was the first to necessarily do it, but that's a big revel uh, revolution for me in Bioshock and Bioshock Infinity. Well, I just want to be clear, I didn't invent this. I think this was Austin Grossman in System Shock One, the writer. So I think he invented it, or maybe somebody else, but I, I would definitely not credit myself. So we, I, I put them in System Shock Two, but they were all already in System Shock One. Actually, the first version of System Shock One came out on floppy disk, and they just had text audio diaries and then the CD version came out and that's when I first played it. And I remember hearing the performances, they're all done by people at the studio. It wasn't like professional actors, but the naturalism of it, you know, this sort of, and I had never seen that in a game, just like, Oh, I believe these people exist. 
Like these seem like normal people caught Absolutely. up in a terrible situation. And I love the notion of normal people caught up in a terrible situation because I think all situations that are terrible are normal people caught up in a terrible situation. Nobody's born a warrior, you know, nobody's born, you know, a, a leader. You, you, you end up in situations and then you've kind of got to figure it out. And I, I love the feeling of that. And I've never seen that in a game. So I think the special genius of it that, you know, that Austin invented is because it's spoken, it can't be very long. And it forces you as a writer, like they're like, I can't remember. We, I, I had um, Drew Mitchell, the writer in the, um, my, my, my right hand guy on the writing side on, on, um, on Judas. I said like, you know, we, we, I'm like, we were writing up some new audio logs for the game. And, um, and I said, well, cause that's how long were the ones in Bioshock? Cause that seemed like they're about the right length. Mm -hmm. And they're only like a hundred words or something. They're not very long. And yeah, so you got to be judicious with what you're saying. You really yeah. got to write those and rewrite those. Now you have some advantages because they're sort of confessional. Mm -hmm. People can speak. Like if you try to write them, like a lot of young writers come to it, try to write dialogue scenes and audio logs. And you got to use those really sparingly because it's like, who am I listening to? Right. Um, and, and dialogue is, you can get that anywhere, but in an audio log, somebody's telling you that it's like a monologue, right? It's a soliloquy from a Shakespeare play. I mean, not the quality level, but the, um, you know, this sort of delivery mechanism. Mm -hmm. And it's really useful for getting across character. And, um, and I find actors really take to them. I, I've rarely met an actor who could knew what they were doing, couldn't really nail great work in an audio log because it's, 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 a, it's a monologue, right? And actors love monologues and most of them have done a lot practice on monologues, a lot more they practice on dialogue as you do it by yourself. Yeah, it's, it seems to me that it, it also does something very basic, which is it just respects the medium of video games by, not to say that text heavy things don't respect video games, that's cool too, but by saying like, keep playing, keep going, pick me up, hold down the button, yeah. and then just keep exploring. And I just think that that little, that little thing really helped make Bioshock you know, the game it is because it doesn't slow people down. It doesn't bog them down because as much as I love a game like control and it's not that you're on control, I think that game's awesome. It's just like, wow, this is a lot. <laughs> this is a lot you're trying to tell me here. I'm sure you've heard that expression. It's about respecting the gamer's time. And I mm -hmm. really try, I don't like games that don't respect my time. Like I used to hate in like, like I remember I played, I loved Final Fantasy Tactics, but I remember going through the cutscenes, and I'm not a, strangely, I'm not a big, narrative guy in games i tend to play a lot of strategy games and a lot of low narrative games i get my narrative interests mostly go in movies and things like that um but um um i i find that um you really have to respect the gamer's time and so audio logs to do well with that because you can mm -hmm. as you said you can just keep keep on trucking you have to sit and wait for the story so right. i don't like cut scenes i don't put a lot of cut scenes in our games because I don't, I want the, I want to keep playing when I play a game, but that's not for everybody. Like, you know, Neil Druckmann will write a game and write these brilliant, you know, long cutscenes that people love to watch. It's right. just, it's just, I'm a, I'm a nerdy, like I'm more of a just gamer and I like to, I like, I like, you know, keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah. I'm, I'm the same way. I, I love, uh, you know, I always talk that Far Cry, I'm like a huge Far Cry fan. That's like the perfect kind of like popcorn. Yep. You know, I just want to kind of play. I don't even care what the story is. The, yep. the characters are cool. The world's cool. Um, So Bioshock having come out in 2007 and, you know, expression and politicization of the industry being what it is today, I think, and how things have kind of changed. I wonder, was broaching even kind of basic topics like class? Was that something that take two as a publisher had any problem with or were they kind of like do your thing because i feel like there's this argument or this not argument there's this um there's this feeling that companies don't lean into topics that could be divisive or political but i think that the the good publishers let their creatives do what they want so i wonder was there any pushback that back then because it was very different then yeah well so it wasn't really about, well it was sort of about class it was indirectly about class because the little sisters the fact that you you know could harvest the little sisters mm -hmm. um that almost, that almost, the publisher almost, um, 2K almost put their foot down and said no. But we had a guy there at the publisher who was sort of the creative director at the publisher. I'm not sure it was that guy. It was a guy named Greg Gobi. And Greg really believed in the game. He was like this crazy French guy. And he was like very passionate, very, very smart. Um, 
you don't often have like publishing side producers who are really into like, like yeah, Greg came out and worked at the studio for months on the game, you know, like he was very into it and very helpful, very, very smart. And um, he, he said, this game doesn't exist without that concept. Um, because like you said, it's, it, it, it was about class, right? The fact that, that powerful people could use, you know, I, 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 it was like the metaphor is like, what is the worst possible expression of sort of unregulated society we can come up with? And we never intended to be, it's a metaphor, right? You know, like, um, it's, a, it's a, like, it, it worked very well because it was so shocking, I think, to the concept. But, you know, it happens, you know, like when you get, you know, when big factory is, you know, making a, you know, a super fun site out of a river, you know, kids, they're, you know, what happened in Flint, you know, the people suffer, right? Um, and so I was trying to just, you know, do a, a metaphor for an exaggerated metaphor, right? You know, there's no, I, you know, obviously the city at the bottom of the ocean was ridiculous as a concept. You know, it's, that's built like skyscrapers is ridiculous. I mean, physics would not allow, like, you know, we talked about like, oh, you can't have skyscrapers out of the ocean. They, get, they would get crushed in a second. Right, right. And I was like, yeah, I know. But I think the gamers will understand it's a metaphor. And, and so we try to make it very believable once you're in the city that this was a living place and that, you know, there, there were people went to work and people fell in love and people did all those things in, in rapture, but it didn't have to be like purely naturalistic. And those exaggerations help you tell stories, especially in games where, you know, you don't have the, like, it'd be hard for me to do a game as naturalistic as say last of us, even though it's fantastical, you know, the world is very naturalistic, right? Mm -hmm. The zombies are the only fantastical element in that game. Um, but I was able to use so, the larger than life nature of the world to help tell the story and not have to stop and explain everything through cutscenes. We could explain a lot of the world just visually. Um, and that was super exciting. Uh, to get back to your question about um, Art Deco, that came out yeah. of a visit. We were struggling to figure out the look of the game. And, you know, we hadn't really done a game that was super known for its visuals at that point. And I ended up in New York and I grew up near New York, so I knew it very well. And my wife and I were on a trip and we just wandered into Rockefeller Center. Are you familiar? With, you're from, you're from, yeah, I'm from Long Island. So yeah, I'm familiar. Yeah. Long Island, sorry, sorry. So you know yeah. Rockefeller Center. And I wandered back into there and I always loved it as a kid. And for those who haven't been there, it's basically the only, I think it's the only like full city block that is all the same architecture, like designed by the same architects mm -hmm. and all in Art Deco, all in that style. And I looked around and I'm like, oh, so, it, so it's monolithic in its design. I looked around, I said, huh, this is really cool. And I looked at all the buildings and I looked at how square everything was, how, you know, Art Deco was quite sort of simplest. It's quite simple in a lot of ways. That's sort of the point of it. It's, you know, it moved away from Art Nouveau and all the stuff that, that was much more, had lots of squiggly bits. And I was like, this could render really well on the, you know, the level we're in Unreal Engine 2.5 on the Xbox right. 360. It was, you know, early days. It was 15 years ago. And I was like, how do we make this look great? And that simplicity of the design really lend itself to it. So it was like a gift. And we, I went back, you know, my wife and I grabbed, bought cameras, those little, back then you didn't have phone cameras. So you just had, you buy those little cardboard cameras, you know? Right, right. We took just tons of pictures of like, you know, there's a, a lighting fixture that looks amazing. There's a door handle that looks amazing. There's a building, there's a statue, you know, there's this painting. Um, and we just brought it back to the team. And I said, this, this is like rapture. And I think most people, Got it quickly. I'm sure some people are like, well, you know, what are you talking about? Um, but we started working on it and we just stayed in one room for like a couple of months, actually. And because we were we were all over the place before that. I said, no, we're just going to stay in one room and we're going to get this room right. And then we're going to propagate it out. And um, that's what we did. Yeah, it's there's there's iconic parts of that game to me, even just thinking about the opening area with like the different medical offices and. I don't know. It's th that game to me. It, it, I'm a big fan of publisher or developers going back and remaking and, and reshaping their games for future systems and all of that. But that's one of those games that I just think just just lines up perfectly and um, still looks great today, obviously. And um, I wonder with do you feel like. Um, was it difficult to follow a game like that up? 
with uh, with a game like Bioshock Infinite or or, or did you like how do you follow something like that up? I, I imagine it's not easy and it wasn't easy. We, we know based on stories yeah. that have been written about it, but you're going to was it kind of like in the post release environment. You're going to play the world's smallest violin for me. But yeah, it, it is hard. This, I, I know how dumb this sounds, right? I, I get it. Like I'm super lucky to have a game that was that successful, but it does sort of trap you in a way, right? Because you're okay. I've done that thing now and now I've got to do it again. Right. And before, you know, my, my expectation was like with Bioshock, I remember my you know, co-founder of Rational, John Shea, and I used to joke like, oh, if we sell a million copies of a game, like we'll be, our lives will end, you know, then and we'll be perfectly happy. But it sold, you know, a lot more than that. And then it's like, well, what if you don't sell as much as that again? Like, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. And um, it, I think it, it can lead to some unhealthy thinking about competing with yourself. And certainly I remember I came in to, we'd had the, the announce event in New York in 2009 and um, a very nice, I want, I want, I want out of here because I don't know if he, if he wants a story talking about one of, one of my favorite editors of, you know, I don't think he's in the business anymore. Um, that told me, he goes, Ken, you know, they were all supporting you last time because you were an underdog and this time they're going to come after you. And I was like, uh, he's probably right. And, you know, and that's, that's the natural cycle of things. I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't singled out. That's just a natural cycle. You know, everybody's rooting for the underdog. And then if they have a big success, then sort of everybody's looking for them to, you know, maybe, you know, stumble a little. It's a totally natural thing. I'm not, I'm not blaming anybody. And I had decided, and this was in, on me that, you know, I wanted the game. I wanted even a bigger audience. Like I wanted to like, Call of Duty kind of big blockbuster. And so a lot of Infinite mm-hmm. was designed to try to appeal to an even a broader audience. And um, the problem was, is that that's really wasn't the type of gamer I was. I don't play a lot of like big, I mean, I played all those games. I just not like, I don't play a lot of multiplayer games. I'm not very good at it. And I tend to like weirder, nerdier games. Um, you know, I play mostly like indie, you know, roguelikes and, strategy games and XCOM and, um, you know, weird little, oh, you're, you're like midnight suns. That's the big one, right? Oh, I love midnight like. suns. Yeah. I yeah. was just talking to Jake a few weeks ago. I, you know, Jake, I'm a huge fan of Jake Solomon. He's, he's a genius and whatever he's doing next, I'm, you know, I'll be first in line. Cause yeah, I'm excited to see what he does now. Yeah. That was, that was interesting that he left. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, um, you know, I think he wants to, you know, try something different and I get that. Um, but you know, he's the guy who took, you know, XCOM and, my favorite game of all time and then actually remade it even better, which is like almost impossible to do because, you know, it's such a great game. Um, but, um, yeah, so I think I sort of became my own worst enemy a little bit in that. And I, one of the reasons I stopped doing Bioshock games after like that is like, okay, you can't lean on something. You, you know, you've got to, you got to, you can't compete with against yourself again. That's not very, that's not a very healthy way to live your life. So, you know, I was not, I was, I was not, looking to do another Bioshock game, I have nothing against Bioshock. It just, it wasn't super fun to work on it. Cause I, I sort of built a trap for myself. Yeah. That's interesting. I, um, cause it's funny in some ways talking about how people are going to go or be harder on you or go after you. Also, I think the kind of consciousness of games media, the Kotakuization or the polygonization, I think of video games media at that time made the intersection of your game and its subject matter in, in infinite, I think kind of line up in an interesting way with forcing people to, I guess, confront some different issues and, and write about them sometimes fairly and sometimes unfairly. I mean, people to this day talk about the supposed racism of Bioshock Infinite or, or whatever the case might be in these different things. So it's, it's interesting that it kind of lined up exactly the way you thought it would, which, or that that person thought it would for you. And I should say, and that it was going to become more difficult for you. I want to ask you about Bioshock Infinite in terms of, I, I think you and I share this, I get I get this from you. I don't know if this is true or not. Do you find like American history in the United States specifically interesting um, pieces of story to play around with? Like uh, the fall of America, uh, uh, alternate history of America, um, the fracturing of America. All these things are kind of interesting. And I think I think Bioshock Infinite touches on a lot of this stuff, especially through the lens of like the Indian Wars and on this it, very interesting stuff. So. Yeah. Do you find that to be a fun playground for you for, for that specific game? Because I find Bioshock Infinite setting to be, you know, Columbia is awesome, but that it's American. And 
and a bastardization of America specifically similar to a bastardization of Randianism, I think was was a real great draw. And I just I loved that game. And I, I wonder if that was if that was like something that was intentional for you, the United States specifically. Um, I think like we were just trying to figure out what Bioshock Infinite was, right? Because we didn't want to do Rapture again. Mm-hmm. Um, because I kind of felt that one of the big draws of Bioshock was a new world to come to, right? Now, <laughs> that said, we really gave ourselves a lot of problems there because coming up with a whole nother aesthetic and another setting, a whole new set of characters, you know, like, no, there's barely, there's like, uh, is there a single character overlap? I mean, you go to Rapture, but maybe you see- In the DLC, I guess, yeah. In the DLC, right. but in the yeah. original game, so you're doing basically a sequel. In fact, you gave all the advantages to an, an unintentionally to another team that was able to use that entire foundation while you did the hard work of building from the top, the bottom up again. Which yeah, is yeah, that's a blessing and a curse too, because then, you know, part of, I think what people loved about Rapture is coming to a new place, right? That they'd never seen before. So right. I think it was both a blessing and a curse um, I gave to those guys, we gave to those guys because they had to sort of rekindle that same kind of, oh my God, where am I? What is this place? And that's hard. But coming up at that other place is also really, really, really hard. And that took us a while to figure out. And so I think we were like, spent a bunch of time just talking about like, well, what, what is a Bioshock game? You know, mm-hmm. if it's not Rapture, what is it? And um, we thought American history was part of it, you know, because Rapture was set in American history. Um, we thought of, um, and so then we were talking, okay, well, if we're set in history, where, when, you know, and, you know, obviously like if you say, well, it could be 1780, but the problem is, you know, from a game system standpoint, it's just not a lot. It's not a lot of technology, right? And right. you had a lot of technology in, in Bioshock. That was a big part of it. And, and then, so really the first, you know, the technology really started taking off around, you know, 1890, 1900 in, 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 in America, all of a sudden you had electricity and you had movies and cars and airplanes, like this insane amount of stuff in a very short period of time. And, um, that was, you know, probably quite confusing and destabilizing. And, um, and I started reading a lot about the period and then we said, oh, you know, okay, we didn't have anything as clear as Art Deco to drive with. Um, we played around with Art Nouveau for a while, but, um, Eventually, we sort of set upon this sort of, um, you know, the, you know, sort of neo-colonial style that was, you know, very American, right? The American, you know, colonial ar- architecture style. Um, and then, yeah, neoclassicism and all this stuff that, you know, was of the era. And we started d- drawing from that and to some degree having a little fun with it, you know, with the over-the-top nature of it. Um, and, um, and then sort of, you know, we ended up with, with, with Columbia. Yeah, Columbia is amazing. I mean, Columbia is amazing. Um, and I love the combination. I guess this kind of goes back to an interesting or a, a, I'm sorry, a similar question I was asking you earlier, which is interesting to me, which is, again, the the subject matter was this. Were you able to kind of just do this stuff without much problem? Because now you're invoking the United States and some of the history and some some unsavory things. Certainly some of the people I'm sure the publisher wasn't thrilled about some of the things people were writing about it specifically after the fact. But I don't was know. that OK for them. I never talked to them about it. I don't think, I don't remember a conflict on that game. I think maybe after Bioshock, they figured, because we actually had on Bioshock 1, I had a lot, I had a number of times where people were coming after me about the, you know, about the little sisters. I had a couple of press ambushes. Like, not, I'm not even, this was back for the games. The games press was generally more, was pretty supportive of, of you know, innovation and developers. Oh, sorry. There wasn't much of a pushback from the games press on people trying new things. But back then, like I remember a TV crew from a local news station wanted to come to do an interview at my house. And they came over to the house and I got a call from a PR person at 2K. And they were like, don't do the interview. This is an ambush interview. And I had to get them out of my house without sort of letting on that, that I became aware that it was an ambush interview. So I just said, look, I was like, sorry, something else came up. And they were really pissed off. But And I, I've had that a few times. I've had a few things that I realized people were trying to ambush me. But um, I just I think that it it's hard to um, I think once people played the game they understood that our goal was not to make like a child killing simulator. <laughs> but at the time, yeah, there was a bunch of people. I was confronted by some people at events who were like, "I think you should not publish this game." 
I think, you know, I find it offensive. And, um, and I always said the same thing. It's like, I, I appreciate that and I, I get it. And I, I'm sorry you find it offensive, but it's not, you know, that's, that's not how we, you know, I believe it's, it's telling an, an interesting story and I believe we're doing it with taste and, you know, I we probably shouldn't buy it. Yeah. Has, has that, especially kind of the ambushes you're talking about and some of the more, the hit PC kind of things that had come out, does that make you more wary or has that made you more wary of talking to people or being more open? Cause you talk about how you're, we were talking earlier before we began about how you're a recluse in a lot of ways. And I am too. Um, but does, but I, I admit that I'm, mo- I'm much of my reclusiveness comes from maybe not being treated very fairly by a lot of people. So I don't really want to interact with too many people. Do, do you, are you gun shy because of that? Or is that just, are you just kind of naturally? Like I think that? it's, I think it's two things. I think one is that, um, Um, yeah, you, 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 once you have a few interviews where you realize that it's a very strange feeling to be in an interview and you realize the person is actually out to hurt you. Um, and that's their, you know, to some degree, that's their job. You know, I don't really begrudge it. It's just, but it's a very weird situation where this person's being very friendly with you and you realize that the goal of the interview is to make you say some stupid shit. Right. right. Um, and the, but the other more important thing was that I think, when you become somewhat marginally famous, I think there are, it's very easy to fall in love with that. And, and eventually that will fade, you know? And so like you go to a patch and people are coming up to you and wanting your autograph and all this stuff. And I think that's a real, it's very easy. And then, you know, when you're, when you're somewhat famous, you know, you go sometimes you go to a hotel and somebody's like, oh, Mr. Levine, and they upgrade your room, right? And then wow. at some point, like a voice in my head said, is like, you need to stop being, try to stop being a public figure because if you start needing this and wanting this, it's not going to be good for you emotionally. I have my own, you know, I'm, I'm my own, there's it, mental health issues and all that other stuff. And I don't think I was, I don't think I was cut out for like a public life. And so, you know, after Infant, I basically just stopped, you know, I do very few things now. I do. I talk to a lot of students now. I do like interviews for people's classes and stuff, but I sort of stopped seeking out any press opportunities and I'm going to do it for Judas. Um, but it's not something that I was, I'm really like super um, excited about in the way I used to be partly because I, I think that my only goal in life is to be successful enough now where I can keep making cool stuff. You know, and people will trust me to make cool stuff and give me money and trust me to make cool stuff. Everything else, you know, meeting famous people and, you know, you know, hobnobbing and all that other stuff. It's, I just don't think um, I'm good at it. And I don't think that, um, I think it's, I've seen people, I've had friends who really fall down that rabbit hole. It's understandable, right? It's, it's nice to have people adore you and have people recognize you. But eventually you start like going, oh, I hope somebody recognizes me here. Hmm. And that's really bad. That's a really that's interesting. Bad thing. So you feel like you caught yourself kind of like yeah. mid fall there in a way. Yeah. So I just took myself out of the running for that. And um, it probably, you know, eventually time, you know, it's been 10 years since I shipped a game. So like, I, you know, that would have faded naturally over that time. But I really just said, OK, my focus just needs to be I'm working. And so I've just been working for the past, you know, nine years or whatever on this thing. And, um, you know, then spending, you know, getting my life together and, you know, spending more time with my wife and we got a dog and, um, you know, different things became more important to me. But making games has always been, making games is really important to me now. The rest of it is far less important to me. Interesting. Yeah, that's so, that's, uh, does, does that line up at all with kind of the, you have, you had a reputation for being exacting to work with in some ways, does that line up with kind of the, like you're feeling yourself a little bit, or is that just kind of, is that separate that you are, you're exacting to work with? You're still maybe exacting to work with today. I think and that's separate from. The, I think it's a little, yeah. so let me tell you that when you got a, you know, a tens of, you know, many, 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 many millions of dollars project that is dependent upon you. It is, and you have like anxiety issues. That's not a good combination to be because it's scary as fuck, right? Like I, at one point I tried to like get off of if, if, 
and you know, in the middle of it. And somebody I trust told me, it's like, if you do that, your career is done. You can't just walk away in the middle of a, you know, this massive project. Right. They're never going to trust you again. And so I made that decision to stay on it. And I was not in a good emotional position to be running that project at the time, but I did it. Um, but the cost was, is I was anxious all the time. And that led me to, um, that, that led me to like, I was constantly terrified, you know, that's not a good place to lead from and getting sort of control of your emotions and control of your fear is a really critical part. So on this project, you know, I went to take two and I said that, um, look, this is going to be a long one and I'm, but I'm going to have a small team and it's just going to take longer. And I can't tell you how long it's going to take exactly, but I think it's going to be really cool. We have something really special here, but I, I, I need you to give me the time so I can, and well, and I, I knew it couldn't be massively expensive. So, you know, I started thinking about this whole narrative Lego concept and how we can make mm -hmm. games modularly and more cheaply, but still would deliver, you know, the same level of quality. And that's allowed me to sort of recover and, and take a step back and, um, you know, meditation and all these other things and medication. There's all the, you know, there's a whole battery of things, but most of it was understanding that I shouldn't put myself in a position where I am going to be under mass amounts of stress. When you're running, a, you know, and from the day I started, you know, from doing System Shock, where we had 14 months to make that game, to, you know, all the other games and Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite, it was just nonstop. I barely took a day off that entire time. It was nonstop pressure. And uh, I was cracking under it. And I tried to get out of it. And I was told that if I did, you know, quite reasonably, that that would really be the last game I ever worked on. And um, so I had to finish it. Um, also was told that, you know, the team would fall apart and they would get fired and you know, like it would not be That's good. The product would just disappear. And yeah. so I, I stayed on, I mean, I was, you know, just to be clear, I was, you know, compensated, you know, very well and all that other stuff. It was just my own desire to like keep myself from, um, you know, cracking. Um, but I decided I had to really rethink my life after that. Cause I did, I recognized how, how, you know, how much stress I was under and I wasn't, you know, you're not, a leader has to be able to manage their stress so they're not going to be a good leader. Yeah, I want to, I mean, I don't know if you're willing to talk a little bit more about this, but I always talk, I mean, I'm, I'm medicated for anxiety. I am mega anxious. Um, just running my company where, where the stakes are much lower is, is all consuming for me. And so I can totally relate to that. How have you, you talked a little bit about finding yourself and kind of centering yourself. How have, specifically, have you done that over the years? Is, and also have, I feel like I've, I've found just a little bit balanced as I've gotten older. And I wonder if that has just naturally like, I feel like I have more wisdom and I feel like I understand wisdom for the first time in my life as I get older in my, in my, you know, my upper thirties here where it really is a time thing. And I just look back sometimes and I'm like, why did I feel that way? Why did I care about that? Why was I like that? I wonder if that is also a little bit of it too. I'd like to know a little bit more about your process and kind of unwinding yourself. Um, well, so when I decided to become, you know, to re pursue a creative career when I was about 27, I was like, I re-engineered myself. Like I lost all this weight and I started changing how I dress and how I cut my hair. And I just sort of became a different person. And I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to become a creative, successful person. I'm going to figure it out. I joined the games industry and I, and I, you know, I changed physically and mentally, but I sort of built this, you know, I, I built this, um, production machine out of myself. Right. And all, the only thing that mattered to me, cause like I didn't have any money, you know, my parents, I wasn't, um, you know, my parents paid for my college, which was very generous of them. That was the last time I ever got for them. So I knew I was on my own and I was like, I need to, I'm, you know, I was 28 or whatever. And I'm like, I have to, I have to make enough money, you know, for the future. And, and so I was like, this is my, you know, if I'm going to go for this, I have to go for it. And I, everything else has to fall aside. And uh, so I built myself into something that could, you know, really work incredibly hard and be incredibly focused. Um, but you know, there was a pretty shaky foundation under all that stuff, you know, and I'm sure I have a similar experience you've had, you know, uh, you know, depression, anxiety, all that, all that kind of stuff that, that comes along with it. And then on infinite, I got, um, obsessive compulsive disorder came in, like at one point in the project came in and slammed me. Um, for, I don't know if people know, but it's obsessive, intrusive, unwanted thoughts about things that are really unpleasant. I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but I haven't, no. No. And um, 
And so I'd be in meetings and all I could think about was the thing I was obsessing over. And like, I couldn't walk down the street without, um, like, I remember I was in New York once for an, an event and I was walking down the street trying to get back to my hotel. And I kept seeing, I was obsessing over this, you know, like, um, let's say there were ears, people's ears. I was obsessing. I had this thing called body dysmorphia by proxy. And I would see people's ears and they'd be outsized large and they would freak me out. And they weren't, of course, they weren't actually outsized large. I was just, that's what the disease says to you. And so like, all I could think about were people's ears, 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 all. And it's, it's really bad. I mean, a lot of people have this with, um, with, um, you know, like, um, contamination and they, they think they, people wash their hands a hundred times. Right, right. It's very similar to that. And so I'd go to work and I'd be in meetings and all I could think about were people's ears. And, um, and it wasn't really, as I said, it wasn't really ears, but you know, it's, it's, it's a personal thing. And it's just, you become insanely focused on something that just doesn't matter. And, and you, and so for the last two years of the project, I was like having this problem. And I, I and I saw somebody, um, I saw this um, person, it's something called, um, and for people who have obsessive compulsive disorder and they're not aware of it, there's something called um, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is essentially they get you comfortable with the therapist, gets you comfortable with the thing you're afraid of. And it's by slowly introducing to you, like if say you're afraid of spiders, mm -hmm. they would bring a spider into the room. But first they draw you a picture of a spider, right? And then they'd show, show you a video of a spider. And then eventually there'd be a spider to the other side of the room. And eventually you touch the spider. And it's really hard, but that's how you defeat the disease is by confronting it. You don't run away from it you confront it. And that's how I got, and I got, that got fixed right about the same, the time the game shipped, which is probably not um, an accident. Um, but then after that, you know, a bunch of stuff happened and I sort of, I had a lot of putting myself back together to do, but fortunately, you know, take two was generous with the time. And I was able to spend like the next few years, just like getting my head together. And I was, you know, like you, it was medication, meditation, therapy, all this other stuff. And I was able to then get back where I could work, and still be productive, but I had to do it at a somewhat slower pace. And then as I got stronger, I was able to pick up the pace again. But I'm not, I don't want to return to the pace I used to be at. Yeah, I, I, I hear you, man. I mean, it's sad to hear that, but I, I understand, like I totally get it. And I learned through my own process of trying to heal or whatever that, you know, of just the very feeling of being depressed. Like I didn't really know that that's where my anxiety came from, you know, and how quickly a person who knows what they're talking about can diagnose you and figure you out. You know, if you're just open to it. I you really, so you found, you found good people to help you? Yeah. I found a guy when I lived in LA, I, um, I found a guy there who was great. And then, uh, I'm actually working now with a guy here in Virginia to kind of unwind myself from so, some of the medication if I can. Um, and also like to just smoking way too much marijuana. So it's like, I have to stop, <laughs> I have to stop doing that too. But it's like, I, I need to come. I, I totally understand having this, uh, this active mind and I just need to, Calm down. I try to channel it into creative things, but it's not always easy to do. I wanted well, to ask you. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I just want to say one thing before I move on. Please. I think you're figuring this stuff out when you're 38 versus I'm 56. So I it took me a lot longer to figure this out. And the fact that you're running a company and you're able to keep your sanity is, you know, you should give yourself a pat on the back for that because it's you're 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 ahead of schedule, which is good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm I'm blessed to have some good people in my life and. I think less is more in a lot of ways too, you know, like giving more to less or giving more to fewer people and trying to kind of limit the scope of where my mind even travels, I think has been helpful. But I wanted to ask you a little bit about, cause you had, you had mentioned take two's patients. And I wanted to ask you about that because to, from my perspective, from the outside perspective, it seems clear to me that take two understands that they have a very important creative and they need to take care of him. And I think there are a lot of publishers that wouldn't let someone take 10 years in between their releases or whatever. Um, and yet I feel like it's like the anti, and I don't want to throw Konami under the bus for no reason, but it's like the anti Konami, not knowing what they have with Kojima, right? It's like, you just do anything you need to do to make that man happy. Don't you understand? Like you, you have to keep that nucleus together. What, what's, what is that relationship like with your publisher and where does that patience come from? Because I think a lot of people from the outsider surprised by it, though pleasantly surprised by it. Cause you, you would think it would be more cutthroat than that. I take two is a very unique company. Um, I, I never worked for, I, I was not good at working for other people. I was always sort of an entrepreneur. Um, and take two, I've been working for since, I don't know, 17 years now or something, a very long time since they acquired us. Um, they acquired us shortly, you know, sometime before we did Bioshock. 
And um, I think, you know, and so I report directly to the president, Carl Sladoff, who reports to the chairman. So we're sort of our own little weird one game publishing, you know, unit called Ghost Story Games under them. And they have these sort of label structure that Rockstar and their 2K and Private Division and Zenga, you know, they, so there's all, so there's sort of a bunch of different sub companies running under this larger label. And I think the one thing Take-Two understands, and the reason I think a lot of their games are very high quality is they understand what the quality is a very hard thing to find and it t- and it, you've got to find it and then rushing it out the door before you found it is not um it's not a it's not a solution now i'm sure it must be very frustrating for them because like i don't think at the beginning it, anybody thought it would take this long but the way you build trust is you just be very transparent and you show them progress and you tr- i never try to over promise anything like i've i've so I'm absolutely sure of like, okay, this is the data shipping on, you know, I'm going to just continue to say, hey, let me just share with you the progress you've made so you can make your own judgments. Um, because games are very, very hard to predict. And really the game is going to be great. Not only when we're done with it, but we've had enough people play it where we feel it's ready for the gamer. So they're going to be, you know, we are reasonably confident they're going to have a good experience with it. But they're on board for that. Um, I think they know that because they work with, you know, like Rockstar, you know, only makes really high quality stuff. And right. 2K has done a ton of high quality stuff. And, um, and you know, you got to, if, you, if you've spent all this money and then you ship it before it's ready, I mean, you see what happens. It's not great. Yeah, indeed. And it's cool to know that a, a mega publisher, the guys that publish, like you said, Grand Theft Auto are working on making get Grand Theft Auto 6 out there are also incubating you know, it's funny to call it a smaller product, but based on your the st- yeah. size of your staff, you know, you'd be the smallest PlayStation studio, for instance, by far, I think. Um, which yeah, we're, be, we're very, I mean, we're very small um, yeah. as a team. And so, you know, that was our strategy too, is we just would tell them we're, we're going to have a relatively low burn rate. And I think that's what happens. One of, one of the biggest problems with teams, big teams, is you you build up this huge team to ship a game and then the game's done. And the creative pe- the creative leads have no idea what's next. And so you have this, if you're not a multi-product studio, right. you end up with people sitting around not knowing what to do next. And so by keeping the team really small, not only do we have a very low burn rate and, and doing over more time, like that's the one, that's the one sort of um, modifier that I hadn't really seen a lot of people think about is like, what if you just had a lot fewer people and you took more time? It's not really in line with like sort of, you know, publicly facing companies quite often, but, but I think they viewed us as an, ex, you know, sort of an experimental unit of seeing if, how this works um, because the cost is, is going to be relatively, you know, <laughs> relatively low for a, you know, a, a triple A title because of the way we structured it and the modularity and all the things, you know, all these sort of innovations we're trying to come up with how we work. But um, it allows us breathing room in a way that when I was, you know, had 200 people, you know, waiting for every decision or 300 people or 400 people, you, the pressure that puts on you makes you, you know, it doesn't make, always push you to make the best decisions. Yeah, I, I couldn't. I, <laughs> that seems like a lot. I wouldn't be built for that personally. I don't. I think I'd have to know my own weakness to know I couldn't lead a team like I think, that. Yeah, I think there are certain people who are, but like I'm not built for that either. Um, yeah. I'm. I really like knowing everybody. Um, and um, but back then, certainly, and maybe even so now, I don't know because I don't really talk to a ton of people outside of Take Two. You know, that's one question. It's like, well, how many people do you have? Well, how are you going to make a game if you don't have fewer than 400 people or something? And it's just like right. bigger. I mean, I can't imagine how many people worked on, you know, God of War or whatever or or, or the new Jedi game because they're so big. And, yeah, and those are $200 big. million dollar games, yeah. you know, yeah. at least. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's crazy, man. I'm, I'm I'm very interested to see once, once Judas comes out and how people respond to it and w- w- maybe people can glean some interesting lessons from the way you guys do things, too. Um keeping churn rate rate low. How do you choose your collaborators? I wonder, I wonder if you've ever talked about that. Like when you were moving over, kind of dissolving irrational, moving over into, into ghost story and kind of getting a smaller thing going, how do you know who you want to bring with you? Did you have like a core team that you wanted well, to take or were there, what did you kind of go and get your all-star team? Well, I, what happened is I resigned my position at the end. Cause I was like, I can't, I can't run the studio where I'm not your guy. Cause I, because of the sort of mental condition I was in. And um, Take-Two said, well, you know, what if you were to start a smaller thing under Take-Two? 
like you said, because I said, I'm going to go start something much smaller. I really appreciate all the opportunities you've given me, but I can't. I'm not the guy who can, you know, I'm not going to be effective managing those p people anymore because, I'm, you know, I, I barely got through Infinite. Um, and, um, and so then that studio became, you know, basically 2K Studio. And um, mm -hmm. at that point, and, you know, you could... Um, and so I went off with a small group of people from the studio and we, you know, started a ghost story and, you know, we, you know, it was very small. We were only like 12 people at that point. Um, and, um, I chose people from the product that I felt comfortable working with. And some of them were quite junior, you know, some of them were people, you know, that was like their first game. Um, some people are more experienced. Some people I'd worked with for a very long time, like Sean Robertson, some people that like, just came out of QA, like Drew Mitchell. Um, and then, you know, our, our head of technology, you know, um, Eric Erland, you know, I had known on Infinite, but the team was so big, I had barely interacted with him. So I actually was talking to somebody else originally and he wanted to go somewhere else. So he's like, well, you should really talk to Eric. And I talked to Eric and I'm like, well, this guy's really smart. And, um, and so, you know, we started and, you know, frankly, we really had no idea. I had done that talk on Narrative Lego. I knew the sort of structure I wanted to build something under, but we had, there was no game, there was no characters, there was no world, there was nothing, no look. And, um, and even the, you know, the whole system, the narrative ego comes was a PowerPoint I made. It wasn't like we had, it, it didn't exist as a game system. We had to sort of build all that from scratch. And I knew that was going to take a long time. I knew we were going to kiss a ton of frogs along the way. So, um, you know, and then along the way we've, you know, I've, I've hired people I've known for, I've had a lot of people come in and out of the project. I've, you know, I brought like guys like, you know, um, Raf from Arcane, you know, like who left for Arcane. He came to work on the game for a while, then he went off to do his own thing. And um, people, I, and then the ton of people I worked with before, like tons, I don't know how many people for Infinite and Bioshock when have come back, but like probably 30, 40 people who've worked before, you know, have come back. Sometimes individually and sometimes like, you know, there's companies like, um, um, like disbelief, which are, you know, a bunch of coders who were like the core technology team on infinite and they have their own company now. And we sort of, you know, we contract them out. And so we, we, you know, we work with them, we work with people all around the globe. And then like, I built a new writer team out of, um, I, I want to, for some reason, I got this impulse to find a lot of people who didn't work in the games industry before. And I was wondering, could I train up some writers to write, you know, our kind of games specifically. So Drew Mitchell and I, as I said, who's sort of my, my narrative partner in crime, we built a team of very young writers, most of whom come from, um, not even from film, because none of them are like Hollywood people. They're all people like film students and stuff. And they've done an amazing job at um, learning the ropes because writing for games is very difficult. You're, you're not just writing f a story, you're writing for a game design, right? And the closer you understand that game design, the better you're going to be. And a lot of writers don't play the game a lot. Um, a lot do, but a lot don't. And and so as a writer, I've always been a writer game designer and I've always really loved game design. And so I've always made a real effort to, you know, like audio logs are a great idea of, of a designer who understands game, of, you know, Austin really understanding game design. Indeed. Yeah. Um, where, you know, so like the big daddies for me were like a narrative component, but also I, a game system. So I designed it both as a game system. Well, I designed as a game system first. Most things I usually design as game systems first. Like Elizabeth was a companion character, but I had no idea what her character was. And we knew we wanted to build on the character work we had done in, in Bioshock 1, but really make it central. And then, you know, in this game, I had a system. I had this narrative Lego system, right? Um, and if you could put a link to the talk I did on it, if people are curious. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'll write a timestamp. Yeah. Um, but it was like, you know, that was like nine or 10 years ago. And I had this whole idea of how to do games with this sort of make narrative games that are much more reactive to the player the player um thing and not everything from narrative lego got in but enough did that we i think we're i think we're achieving you know a sense we're going to deliver on a bunch of that stuff and that's going to be pretty interesting um we haven't talked about exactly how we're doing that yet that'll be for you know down the road but it's still our guiding star um it's just some ideas we had you know like a long time ago but you eventually figure out, like, oh, what is the actual application of that? And that takes a long time. But um, I've had really good collaborators on this game, and they've been mostly very lovely to work with. And uh, I've got a great partner, and, um, um, you know, I, I hired a producer who did Shadows of Mortar, and that's been a huge fan of that game. So Zeb Waddell came over, and I just kept building up a great team of collaborators over time.
Yeah, and it seems like you're able to take two kind of gives you that flexibility with contractors and keeping yeah. the nucleus small. It's that's cool, and it seems like that's the way a lot of games are being built more collaboratively than ever in that way. Yep. Um, so I'm wondering, <laughs> was it frustrating? I was I was doing I didn't want to read too much um, and get to prepare for this. I don't like because I don't like I don't like predetermining the direction an interview like this will go. But I came across the article from Bloomberg that they wrote in early 2022 about kind of the troubles of your game, which was unnamed at that time and um, was re- remained unnamed in that in that article. Like we said, it was it didn't leak at all. But that no hearing what you're saying now about kind of the slow and deliberative way you're making games, kind of the patience of take to the leadership there to give you time and energy and able to find yourself and then iterate on these small on the smaller project that will turn into something bigger. That article kind of in reading it now seems to have missed the point. And I wonder if things like that are frustrating to read, especially because I know I've had hit pieces and other pieces written about me. You know, they're going to come out because they ask you for comment ultimately. Yeah. So I wonder how, if that was frustrating, spe- specifically because you were less than a year away from actually showing the game, although maybe you didn't know that at the time. It, it was What is that like uh, to the to your process of making games and kind of having this story written about you that that requires a lot of people to be talking about you, basically? So. It's very strange thing, and you probably have this experience once you become sort of better known than, say, the average person, mm-hmm. that you're usually used to being able to like track all the people in your life and making sure you have good relationships with all the people in your life. But, you know, once you start getting better known and, you know, and you start reading like, oh, some person you never met saying X about you on the internet or Y about you on the internet, it can get upsetting. I think that um, part of, I think social media can create a lot of emotional problems for people. But once you sort of realize that I very, you know, you don't have a ton of control over that stuff. You really have to um, say, look at anything and say, is there something valuable here? Even if it hurts to read, can I take something away value from this? And what's valuable here and what's not? I think it's reasonable that people who worked on the game. So I think one of the biggest critiques of the process was that, you know, it taken a long time. Um, and one of the reasons it took so long time is we wanted to avoid things like, you know, the kind of work style we had, you know, we did on previous games because we had so many people, the demand to get it done quickly, you know, quick, relatively quickly was very, very big because the money was just, you know, you just hear, you just hear the, the you know, the, 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 the money flying out the window. And so this was one of the key reasons we wanted to do it differently. However, given that the game was, because we were trying to, we were trying to build sort of sort of blue sky concept. I think it took longer than we might have thought. They didn't get, you know, not radically in terms of the expense, you know, but the time sort of was longer than we had originally thought. And I can understand some people, especially if they're young and they've only done a couple of projects, that might get a little frustrating, right? Because they're like, well, I didn't, I didn't know this game was going to take this long. And even though it wasn't like high pressure along the way, super high pressure along the way, because very different than the other titles, it's just a lot of time. So I read it as sort of like individual people that might not align with individual people view of their life and how many games they want to ship. Because when I was younger, I got to ship a whole bunch of games. Right? I never worked on a game for this long before. Right. The longest I ever worked on something was probably Bioshock 1, you know, because that was, it took a long time to set up. And so it was, we were kicking around for a long time. It's probably seven years or something like that for Bioshock 1. Um, basically ever since System Shock 2, there was like an idea we would do something like that again. So that was a long time coming. And then Infinite was about five years, um, but System Shock 1 was 14 months. And so um, um, I think that there's, I understand why people, that wasn't for everybody. And that's, like, I always say this to people, like I've had people who come to me and say, you know, I don't believe in this or I don't believe that in the game. And my general response is like, well, let me tell you my view on it. But if you still feel that way, this probably isn't the, you know, you shouldn't be somewhere where you feel that this is not good for your career. Because one thing I'm proudest of is that people who leave after working on games with us, it's usually the first thing they put on their resume, you know, Bioshock or Bioshock Infinite or System Shock. Mm-hmm. And I think that, uh, you know, your career is long. You know, you work on a product for a few years, but your career is long. And if you can benefit from, oh, you worked on that game, right? Because I always look at that when I see somebody like when Zeb came in and I saw he had done Shadows and Mortar. I'm such a fan of that game. And we just started talking. We also, remember we had a talk like this on Zoom one night for like hours. And I wanted to... Um, you know, just understand that experience of well, what's it, what was it like to figure that out? You know, to figure out that the nemesis system that it worked was that exciting? You know, all those nerdy questions I had, all those fanboy questions I had. Um, but you know, um, 
I think that the game the game's taken a long time and not everybody's got the same v- view of it. So it's frustrating in the sense that I think we were trying to address a lot of the concerns that, you know, people, journalists often write about in terms of, you know, the work culture environments. Right. But look. That's like a damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of thing, right? Because you're like responding to old things and yeah, now new problems. At the end of the day, you know, it's the same what I said about being, you know, famous. You really just have to focus on the craft. And so that stuff used to bother me a little more. But a few years ago, I kind of had an evening where I like deliberately said something online that I thought was going to piss people off because I was like, I need to inoculate myself from this feeling of caring about this. Cause this, like, the worst thing that can happen to you as a writer is if you're afraid, mm-hmm. a writer who's afraid can't tell the truth. And that's all you're trying to do when you're right. Like that's what people respond to. They respond to the truth or at least people trying to tell the truth, revealing something true about the world. And you have to lose the illusion that you're some perfect entity. You know, you have to lose the illusion that everybody's saying about you. Everybody talks about you is wrong. You know, because look, everybody's got different perspectives. And the same way I think there are a bunch of people out there who I have, and even people I love, there's lots of critiques I'd have of them, um, vice versa too. Doing that and taking all that heat on Twitter, that was like the last time I posted something that I deliberately tried to post something really controversial. And it was really freeing. Because it was like it was like an inoculation. It was cognitive behavioral therapy. It was the, it was the spider. And so yeah, I that's so interesting. Spider. And I tell you, <laughs> as soon as I did it, you know, I took a little Dutch courage and I did it. And it was the healthiest thing I've ever done in my life. And so now I just like I I just try to have honest conversations on the team of like, well, how do we feel about this? You know, how do you feel about that? And if somebody challenges me now, like I think before, I was much more insecure and when you're in, insecurity is the root i think of most personality flaws almost all you probably say hitler was probably deeply insecure you know at his, at his <laughs> our work you know yeah. if, he, if he was a successful painter you know would have been very different in, in, yeah that would have been that's you know, like Weimar a butterfly Germany. effect yeah biggest um, butterfly effect of the 20th century perhaps yeah and um and so it was shocking that effect of you know i you know brought that see, cognitive behavioral with everything i touch a spider and then those articles just meant to say, I read them and I, I read, I read things about me because look, maybe there's some interesting insight. It's interesting to see what people say about you and you have to be open to saying, Oh, that's, that's not a bad point. But, you know, I also understand it's people who maybe had different goals and different objectives in their life. Right. And maybe this pro and clearly this project, you know, wasn't right for them. I've said that to many people. I've said to people, like sometimes people in service, look, maybe you're not happy here. Maybe this isn't the right place for you. Have you thought about that? You know, we like you, but you don't seem happy. And, um, and we often, you know, part with people as friends and, and give them a nice, you know, if they want to leave, even people who quit, we've sometimes, you know, have given them a cushion because they had, you know, they've been with us for a long time and they just eventually, you know, it wasn't for them anymore. And I appreciate that people spend, you know, people in this project, there's, there's a bunch of people who've been on this project for a very long time. And I really, it means a lot to me because I understand that. It's, it's a big chunk of your life to put f- your faith in somebody else. To put their faith in me for that long, I really, I've grown to appreciate that over time in a way that maybe I couldn't when I was younger. Yeah, it's a, there's a loyalty there and and certainly they share a vision. They want to see it through. It, it could be what you're saying. They understand what it means to have that on your resume to be part of something that might end up being meteoric in its own way. Um, you had brought up a little bit about you know, expressing yourself. And I know this is something you and I talk about privately, and I wanted to bring this up. Um, I, I think from a broad sense, I'm curious from like a 40,000 foot view, how do you feel about um, the full spectrum of, of expression in games right now? Do you feel like games are telling the full spectrum of stories? Do you feel like the media is allowing developers and publishers to explore different ideas? From my perspective, in in some sense, it's it's it says a lot about a game like Bioshock or Bioshock Infinite that we still talk about it and love it today, and we say still like it's been that long. It's been fifteen years and and nine years respectively. But we play so many games and so many products come out that you would think it would be subsumed by something at some point. And we were talking about GTA Five before. I mean, what does that say about that game that it's still relevant? You know, today it it, it says a great deal. Um, but it I also think it says a little bit about risk aversion about sameness. When I think about games that say something political or social, it's usually really trite, very samey or very safe. Or you think about something like Call of Duty or Homefront, 
or something that tries to tell like a story about conquering in the United States. No one, no one's ever really trying to tell, or a few people are trying to tell stories that are too serious. I look, a, I look a lot of a lot of AAA development, though I love a lot of these AAA games. We were talking about the mindlessness of some of them. That there is something missing, um, and I feel like it comes. I, I personally feel like a lot of it is rooted in this old sense of media gatekeeping in some sense that certain things simply aren't allowed to be said. Certain things aren't allowed to be expressed. And I'm concerned about this, not only in games, but with the people that make games, what happened to John Gibson, for instance, at tripwire. And I don't know if you're familiar with that story, but it's an awful and unfair and ridiculous situation. Same thing with the Scott Cawthorn guy that made five nights at Freddy's and others. So there seems to be a, um, a monoculture in video games. And I wonder if you identify that too. And what you might think about that. I think there's a bunch of factors at play. Um, no, I've always been in more than more is better. Like I remember like when say gone home came out and people are like, Oh, it's not really a game. And I've, I've always felt that the more games, the better. And, you know, and there's a lot of critique of people of gamers being gatekeepers. And then that's sort of inverted where you then had other people becoming the gatekeepers and saying, well, we don't want these types of games. And right. I'm a pro I'm an art, I'm an art person. Like I'm an art guy. I like art. I like challenging art. I, I like going to see something and just feeling, Oh my God, I can't believe like, that somebody had that idea. Right? I can't believe I never expected, you know, that to happen. I think that, but there's risk. Whenever you do something like that, you're taking a risk. You're taking two kinds of risk. One is, one is I think a very reasonable risk, which is, you know, if you're spending, you know, as you said, 200 million, 300 million, you know, if somebody's doing one of these huge games, a billion people on it, it needs to be go down fairly smooth. So you can have million, like how do you make something like, you can't understand. I I can't comprehend. Like say Bioshock, you know, you know Infinite sold what 10, 15 million copies, right? Fifteen million copies, and then how many people played their friend's copy or bought it used? You're probably talking approaching twenty million people or something who played it. You can't imagine what it's like to have twenty million people experience something, right? Um, and so you can't try to make a game that appeals to that many people is pretty much impossible. You really just have to guess. There's nobody who really knows. Like, do I know that Judas is going to, you know, appeal to like 10 million people, you know, or whatever. I have no idea. You know, I just always take the approach with Bioshock and these games. I'm going to make something I think is really cool. And I think I'm enough of a gamer that I love things that a lot of other people love. And, but I can't, if you try to make something that, isn't what you think is cool. There's no, there's no prayer. I've done that. Like, you know, for instance, um, I think there are TV shows, you know, right now, probably if you're working in Hollywood, almost all the work is in genre, you know, like, like superhero stuff or, or mm -hmm. star Wars or whatever. And I love all that stuff. Right. So if somebody came to me and said, you want to write one of these? I'd say, sure. And I know the material and I'd be super, you know, I, I don't really want to do it now because I don't really like working on other people's IP, but those IPs I get that I could, you know, if, 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 asked, I could probably at least do a reasonably good job. Um, but I've worked on things once. I once worked on an IP that I didn't love and I needed the job. And if you're in Hollywood now and you, and you have all the work is in these genre things, most of the people working on those things don't like the genre too. And they're kind of embarrassed by it because they're not nerds, right? They don't, mm -hmm. they think, oh, this, you know, fucking, you know, Ewoks or whatever. It's a little nerdy. You know, you and I like, oh, cool. But a right. lot of people, so you have sort of normal people who are now tapped in the same way if I was tapped to write the Barbie movie, I probably would, wouldn't know what to do. Actually, I know the guy who, one of the writers, I know, knew, I went to college with Noah Baumbach, so maybe he could teach me how to write the, um, the Barbie <laughs> movie. But it's not something I would know how to do. Um, and so they're sort of stuck having to do something that they're not in love with. So I think that, so you have to, you know, you have to find people who, you can trust to run these massive teams and those people may be really good managers, but they're not always necessarily people who are in love with the thing they're making. And you have all this pressure from the publisher in many cases to be like, well, you this better work out, kid, because we're spending, you know, two, three hundred million on it. You better not blow it. And so don't take risks. The other thing is, I think, and so that's understandable. I, I think at the end of the day, you have to overcome it. if you want to be successful. You really have to try to get past that fear. And take two, I think, is very good. You know, I think because they were built, they were house built on GTA which was incredibly risky, both from a design and an aesthetic standpoint, they're more risk tolerant than a lot. That's of a great point. I never even thought of that. I never even thought about that. That's such a great point. Where, yeah. you know, EA is more built on John Madden football, right? So right. You, know, there, it, you have these very different sort of cultures that form out of that. Both are valuable and good. I don't know why I never thought of that. That's so interesting. Yeah. Um, 
And so, even games like Manhunt being a big deal and all the other things, they always took the heat. Yeah, 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 because you know those guys wanted to sort of ring some bells and do some cool stuff, and they had they knew they understood that people would want to be, you know, a gangster running around this, you know, a giant city and you know committing crimes and and you know all the satirical humor that, in those games. But I think what I think the big mistake that people have done in the past ten years is so when you do any kind of market testing, there's things about statistics that are really important. Like you have to there's things like uh, I don't know if you know the terms like self-selection. If you, um, you, so like, so you have to, there are things that make data worse and better. The thing, the thing that makes the data really bad is like, if you have people choosing, instead of randomly selected people, there are people who choose to take a survey, for instance, right? And they're, they're from a narrow demographic. Right. Or if they're, they're self-reporting on their feelings about things rather than a neutral observer reporting their feelings on it, like watch them play because self-reporting is notoriously unreliable. Um, small data sets, you know, okay. I, I, I asked three people about this game feature and they all hated it. Well, maybe if you asked a thousand people, these three would be the outlier and everybody, or vice versa. Maybe they'd all, you know, these people loved it. If you asked a thousand people that you may get a very different piece of data. So there are all these ways to do bad data and right. we talk about this and in, 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 cause we do like, you know, like, folk, you know, if you do a focus test and you have people play the game, you want to get, you want to make sure your data is pretty clean. And, you know, I, I was, I was a drama major, so I don't know that much about this stuff. But, you know, I make, I make a study of things I need to make a study of. Twitter is the worst possible focus test for a million reasons. One is about, so Twitter is a relatively small part of the population who are tweeting, right? They're generally very well educated and generally essentially 1% of the Twitter audience is producing almost all the tweets. And so the amount of people who are expressing feelings on Twitter are very self-selected and very frag, very small, and they tend to have extreme beliefs. So you tend to have people extreme on one political spectrum and extreme on the other being the most vocal. So if you think Twitter is a good focus test, you're really getting very bad data. So a lot of people, they're, and this is what I was talking about the spider, you know, with, with my own tweet, you know, getting over my fear that is you need to discount really Twitter as a as a data point. It's not because there aren't great ideas or great people on Twitter. It's just because from a statistical standpoint, it doesn't hold up. And I think for the past, you know, 10 years, people have been using Twitter as a legitimate data point on on. Now, if you want to know what sort of game journalists think or journalists think, it's a great data point, right? Right. Because they're all on it. You right. tend to have almost you know, a huge amount of the journalist community is on Twitter. Reinforcing themselves, you know, in, the, in that bubble. Yeah, well. yeah. You, you know, the, there – and, yeah, there's all things about group behaviors and stuff you could look at. But even, you know, assuming it's all, you know, it's all good faith stuff, it's still very small and narrow group. So it's a really good thing if you want to know, like, how it might review or something might get covered in the press. That's really good. But for the 15 million people or whatever you hope play your game, that's not a, that's not a, that's not meaningful data. Because most people play the game, you know, do you think most people play video games really even know who I am? have any idea who I am? You know, people play Bioshock, they have no idea who I am. Probably maybe a million of those people might know who right. I am. Most people know, they barely know that, you know, they don't know what ghost story is. They don't know. They just see a game box and their friend tells them it's cool and they buy the game in the same way that I think about like a movie, you know, or something like that, or, or like a, a book or, you know, a YouTube video. Like, I don't. I trust what my, you know, my friends turn me on to things, you know? Um, and I think we tend to think that there's this intensely focused intelligentsia who are the gaming buying public. And really it's most people just going about their daily jobs and they want to have some fun and they want a cool experience and they're not paying attention to all the debates going on in the games industry. And I think it's, it's good to like, I read Twitter every day. Like I'm, I, I like, I enjoy it. I don't really post on it because I think yeah. that's I, I read it too. I don't post it. I only post promotionally now. But um, mostly the pedantic shit is what really drove me away because, you know, it's like the old joke. You can say anything and then someone will say, like, but what about this? You forgot about this. And I'm like, I can't take it. So I just removed myself from that situation. Yeah, it, it's it, fun to read. It's, yeah. it's not it's not. I don't think look, I appreciate all the people I know who are on it, who are providing me all the entertainment. I found for myself, if I tweet and then you're looking to see how many likes it got, that's not a healthy way. Definitely. It's not a healthy, it's, a, it's a, especially for your younger people. I don't necessarily younger people. For me, it was super unhealthy. So I basically stopped posting mostly because I don't like what it does to me. Um, and I think it, um, 
man, I, but I would never, I've never really been a person who gets on in shit fights ever, gets shit fights with people. Um, I just don't, I never really understood that. And, but I, but I did have the thing where I post something, a funny joke and I'm like, Oh, how many people like my funny joke? And that's not, it's not, especially for younger people. Um, but especially, but even for older people like me, it's not good. I mean, I'm, I'm really lucky that I, I really feel like I'm, I was at the cusp of being affected by that. I always talk about on our shows how, you know, Facebook was founded when I was in college and I went to Northeastern right in your neck of the woods and we were one of the first schools on it, but that was when I was a sophomore in college, you know? So by that time, and it was nothing compared to what it is now. So like I almost kind of that formative time, I almost, I escaped just, just by the skin of my teeth without being affected by social media in my most formative teen years. I'm, I feel blessed about that. What you were saying about, about selectiveness is too, is funny too, because, you know, can I always think about, and people joke about this. It's like when you go to Amazon, the more you would rather see a product with four stars that has 5,000 ratings than a product with five stars that has three ratings. Yes. Because you're like, I don't trust that. It, that it's, doesn't it's, seem it's right. Meaning. It's, mean, it's yeah. absolutely meaningless. Right. Um, so, you know, that's, but I think that's why things like Steam reviews and Amazon reviews have become so popular is yes. because the data set is large enough where the rounding errors will get, you know, you'll, you'll get some reasonable data, assuming people aren't review bombing or people aren't cheating up the score and they have some measures against that. That's, you know, seeing 25,000 Steam reviews and it's overwhelmingly positive is generally going to mean something that it's just, and this is not the fault of game reviewers, it's just that sort of, ag, you know, that, 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 that many opinions has a sort of utility that you can rarely get at one opinion. Now it's also real. I also still, there's plenty of, you know, reviewers that I will read, um, you know, cause I trust, you know, I, I don't that I trust your opinion cause I'm, I'm always going to have deviation. Like it's not going to mean they're, I'm actually going to like it, but I'm curious to see what they have to say about it. And they have something interesting to say about it. Well, you talked a little bit of, oh, I mean, going back to the, the, the subject we just mentioned about kind of self sorting and the limited nature of people's feedback. And I love that you brought up steam because Steam is so impressive to me. I mean, I'm a PlayStation guy. That's where we really dwell. And I've always thought it's like, why doesn't Sony just tell some, you know, their engineers like, just go copy what these guys are doing. This is incredible. It tells you how many hours you played. It gives you very granular ways to score things and everyone kind of trusts each other. It's this very small L libertarian kind of situation. And I, I dig that. And then I think of places like Reddit where like our subreddit is, I go there once a week to check in what people are saying. Like it's mostly people that hate us. But then you go and look and it's like 15 people, you yeah. know, they're saying everything. And you're like, we can't really take that very seriously either. So I totally understand what you're saying about that. And it's interesting to hear you deal with it on a much grander scale. I think thinking you're done and thinking you've achieved something is always dangerous because you, things are really shaky and you have to honor those very complicated principles like free expression. Because look, freedom, free expression means people are going to say horrible shit. That's the problem with free expression doesn't mean anything unless people are saying horrible, horrible shit you don't like. Yeah, what's the point otherwise? I, that's That was always my confusion as well. What do people think it's for? You know? And listen, I, I remember my mom told me when I was a kid, um, I don't know if you were, you were the Skokie March in, in, um, in, in, the, in the 70s. No, I don't. I don't know. So, you know, I was, grew up, I was a Jewish kid. And you grew uh, up in Queens, right? I was born in Queens and I grew up right. in New Jersey. Yeah, I was New Jersey, the first okay. year in, a, in a, like a, an apartment in Queens. But I don't remember I was a kid. Um, but then I grew up in New Jersey. And this is about, I think, 1977 or so. So I was about 10 or 11 years old. And I read this thing in the newspaper that in Skokie, Illinois, there was a march, the Na American Nazi Party. You know, these guys, you know, they still back then wear like, you know, they swastikas and all that other stuff. They were going to march in this town called Skokie, Illinois, which was where a lot of Holocaust survivors lived. And I remember seeing this story on the news and being like, oh, my God, how could they let them do that? That's the worst thing I've ever heard. Because I, I was old enough where I sort of started starting to understand what the Holocaust was and all that other stuff. And I went to my mom and my mom was a very interesting woman. She was born you know, in 1938, I think. And so she kind of missed the woman's, you know, you know, feminism and, you know, the early stages of feminism. And she didn't get, she was a really smart woman. She didn't, she, you know, she didn't get to pursue a career. And I think she, but she had a really keen intellect. And I went to her and I said, mom, this is like the most terrible thing. And she said, well, Ken, there's this principle called, you know, freedom of speech. And what it means is that you have to defend the speech of your enemies because otherwise, um, if somebody starts to make decisions about speech, who, who do you trust to do that? Who do you trust to have to say what you can say? 
because you have to assume that they're going to come for you. And I was like, oh, man, I don't I don't know. And then I went off and I thought about it. My mom was really patient with me because I was young. And eventually I was like, OK, I think I understand. And the ACLU was actually at that time defending the Nazis. Yeah. Which. Yeah. Um, and that's what really shocked me. And then but I was like, OK. And then I that's when I first was like, OK, I think what politics is about. It's about sometimes accepting things you really don't like in protection of something really awful, right? Something really, I can't imagine. And look, and I think somebody could fairly critique me and say, well, you weren't in, you know, bergen Belsen or you weren't in Auschwitz. And so you, you, what are you to say how those people should feel? And I think that's a valid critique. Um, I will say that most of the people who were defending the Nazis in the ACU were Jewish. And I think because they believed in a principle that in the end of the day would keep things like the Holocaust from happening again. Because what's the first thing that, do that, that authoritarian governments do is they shut down speech. Mm -hmm. It's like the first thing they do every time. And, the, and the, the universal principle combining all sort of more liberal governments, de democracies, is f more generous versions of speech protections than you see in, you know, say, North Korea or, 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 um, you know, or Russia or, you know, or you know, Saudi Arabia. Um, and it's complicated. And I understand why people struggle with it. Not everybody had my mom, you know, to sort of give them a bit of wisdom when they were a kid. And I've sort of pursued that, you know, that discomfort and live with that discomfort my whole life. But I've yet to be convinced that there's, you know, maybe one day somebody will convince me, but they've yet to convince me that 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 this very bad compromise isn't unfortunately is not the best compromise that the, the only compromise we have. It's uncomfortable and it's bad. But it's better than the alternative because we see what happens to the alternative when the government or somebody else decides what we can say. And that was so well, hard one. That did not exist really until the Enlightenment, you know? Yeah. And, and yeah. it was yeah. really yeah. hard to make happen. We're excited. We're pulling for you, my friend. We can't wait to see the game. We're really rooting for you guys as you get towards the finish line. Great, Colin. And I really appreciate the time. I've, I always love chatting with you. And um, I'm, pr I'm proud of what you've done and you know, built your own business. And it's, it's amazing. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate you. Thank you for your kindness and your friendship. And um, we're, we're pulling for you. And thank you all out there for your love, kindness, and support of all things sacred symbols. And hope you enjoy this conversation. Um, that's it. We'll see you next time. Until Thanks, then. Tom. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay, as promised, just in case you skipped the beginning and didn't see my little prelude, the podcast ends suddenly because uh, Ken and I had a conversation towards the end that he requested to be clipped. We obviously did that for him as part of our agreement. So that's why the end is sudden, but he'll be back. He'll be back when Judas comes out. We'll certainly investigate more at that time. We're thrilled and thank him again and uh, go story for working with us on this interview and this insight into the mind of a great man, a wonderful writer and a, and a, and a great thinker. Um, so I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you again for your love, kindness and support. Bye. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is directed by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-hosts are Chris Raygun Maldonado and Dustin Furman. The show is produced by executive producer Dustin Furman. It's edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by my best friend, Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we're grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. Thank you.